Good morning. God is so good, isn't he? And he's so faithful to meet us here. Well, welcome to Tulsa Hills Church. If this is your first time here this morning, we just want to tell you how glad we are that you're here. You should have received a little welcome packet. Um, please, if you don't mind, fill out the Connect card that's inside. It just gives us an opportunity to get to know you a little better. We have a lot of events going on in the life of the church, so you'll be sure to uh, want to check out your worship folder for all of those details. Um, for everything we have going on, I know you won't want to miss any of that. One of those things is the Lego VBS that's happening next weekend. Uh, we definitely want to be in prayer for the workers as well as the kids for this. Um, there's still spots available to sign up to volunteer if you would like, but for those who have signed up, there's a meeting this morning following the service in the kids' area, so you want to see Amanda O'Donnell for that. We are so excited that Joy Worship, for those with special needs, is coming to Tulsa Hills Church. Amen. There's some volunteers needed, so if you feel God moving in your heart for this, Please don't hesitate. Please sign up at the back counter, or if you would like more information, please contact Pastor Kathy Cott. Financial Peace University elective is back by popular demand. It's really a great way to improve on your finances. So um, if you would like to sign up for that, please uh, contact Kim Wynn. She can get you all the information that you need for that. Open Box Special also begins this fall. Um, I know that's something that a lot of us have gone through and has uh, helped and is something that we can go through again. So if you would like to sign up, please contact Pastor Jim or I uh, believe there's some signups on the table in the back. Elva Han, where is she? <laughs> Yay, is uh, going to be helping us with our scripture this morning and what a blessing that is. So would you please stand and uh, read the word of God this morning? The scripture is found in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do? do to me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated and kids are dismissed to Children's Church. Embrace 
the anointed power of the Holy Spirit on our lives. We're a, a Trinitarian people, right? That means we believe in the Trinity. We believe that we are living in the last days where Jesus is going to be pouring out his spirit on all people. So just a quick reminder again, a summary of, of where we've been. We started remembering that these are the best days to be alive. Acts chapter 2 reminds us that in the last days, God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit in such a way on people that your sons and daughters are going to prophesy, your young men are going to see visions, your old men are going to dream dreams. I'm even going to pour out my spirit on your servants and on your on your maid servants. It's just going to be a it's going to be a cross social, uh, cross uh, generational, uh, cross gen it's going to be all everybody's included in what God wants to do, and He's ready to pour out His Spirit on us as we move forward. In light of that, we're determined in the face of distraction. Remember, we looked at where Jesus said, "Be careful." Because there's going to be plenty of distractions, and you can look at things that are taking place in the world and go, ah, 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 that's it, that's it, no, no. Jesus said, these things are going to happen. But what's most exciting is that I'm, my name is going to be proclaimed throughout the nation. And that, as a last day's people, that's what we embrace. And then we were reminded about our, our personal call to holiness. Again, Peter was even saying, now some are going to come scoffing, saying, that, oh, in the last days, well, the last days haven't come. And so you said this was going to happen, and it didn't happen. And, and so what is this last days about? And, and Peter reminds his the people that are reading that letter. Our call is to live a life of holiness in such a way that people in the church and around the, the church, in the, in the world, and everywhere else that we go, they see a difference that Jesus Christ is making in and through our lives. Last week we were reminded that last day's living calls us not to comparisons of one another, but a life of compassion. That we're not looking to, to see how we size up with those around us to see if we're what kind of measuring stick uh, we're achieving, but we're, we're continuing to grow in the grace of Jesus. And so let's look at this anchor verse that has kind of shaped us. It's, it's, it's spoken to us. Maybe in some ways that we, it's easy to forget. It's one of those verses like you look at, it, it could seem to be a little bit of a, it seems like it's kind of one of those downer verses. Remember, this is not one that you're going to read on your Facebook feed with a pretty picture and, you know, sunset or something in the background and everyone likes it and, and, and everything's wonderful. But this is what Paul writes to Timothy. And Timothy is starting his pastoral journey. good as it's going to be in the last days, there's also going to be terrible times. The terrible times that are described here are not indicative to what's going on in the world. Paul's greatest concern was make sure that in the last days, this is some things we want to avoid within the church, not in the world. You see, we're, we're not a people of comparison, we're a people of compassion, so we don't compare what we're doing right to what other people are doing wrong. We just keep leaning in on the things that God has for us. But in the last days, there's going to be some really terrible things that are going to happen. And it can happen within the church. People are going to become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive disobedient to their parents. We're going to look at that a little bit more today. That will be the phrase that's going to carry us forward. Now, I, 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 want, to, I want to caution you to, to not draw a conclusion already as to what Paul was talking about. Just by a show of hands, we do know that, that Scripture was not written originally in English, right? Do, do we, we, we get that? Okay, some of you go, going, huh? I, I mean, that's, no, it actually was not written in English first. So we're going to spend a little bit of time today, uh, a little, in a few minutes, looking at what Paul was saying actually in, in the original language. You're going to be so smart today. I mean, you're going to get to learn some Greek, and then you can just speak it sometime throughout the week, and people say, wow, that person's really, really smart. So there's, there's that. But we're going to look today at, at specifically a portion of this where Paul warns and he says there's going to be some terrible times that are going to take place within the church during the last days because people are going to become lovers of money and they're going to be boastful and proud, abusive and disobedient uh, even to 
to their parents. There's, there's a, this is the only place in this passage where it speaks to some specifics. Sometimes we need to take the character issues of, of unforgiving and slanderous and all, you know, rash, treacherous and conceited and all these things. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just need low-hanging fruit. I need to understand, what does this look like? I mean, uh, we, we see this list, and Paul, is, it, it's as though he kind of tapped into that question and said, you know what, I think we do need some low-hanging fruit. We do need to understand it a little bit more. So he gives a couple of very, very specific examples of, of things to avoid, things to, to look out for during the, the last days as a holy people. What is God calling us to make sure that, that, we're, that we're, we're not allowing to become part of our rhythm and our way? And, and the first one is just simply this. He says, in the last days, be careful because even people within the church are going to start falling in love with their money. And we, we kind of wrestle with that. Does that mean that, that if, if I have any kind of money at all, if I have any money in savings, that, that, that I must be a, a, a terrible person, that I'm not trusting God? Does that mean that if I spend money on a, on a new pair of jeans, that uh, that, that could be a, a bad thing? Does that mean that if I, if I appreciate or I even think I deserve a raise, does that mean that I'm a, I'm a terrible person? No, I don't, I don't believe that's what, what Paul was, was addressing at all. But it seems as though there was something about the issue of money that Paul is, is dealing with. Let me ask you this question today. What would you do if you received, by virtue of a gift, by virtue of, of whatever, that you received an extra $100? What would you do with an extra $100 today? I don't know. What would you do with an extra $1,000? What, what would you do if, if you actually received one of those letters in the mail from a long-lost relative that didn't live in a foreign country that just needed access to your bank account, that you actually received uh, a, a, an endowment, that you, re you received a, a large sum of money? What would you do with that? And a lot of times, I've got to tell you, I, I've got a laundry list of things that I'd love to do with it. I'd, I'd love to go buy a, a, a new car. I'd love to go uh, spend money on a, a trip. I, I think there's a set of golf clubs that would have my name on it. You know, I would, I would love those things. And maybe that's okay. Maybe it's all right to enjoy a few things in life. You see, I don't, I don't know that Paul is saying that our life in Christ is to just to be this constant drudgery where all we do is just do without, do without, do without, and, and then you're more holy by doing without. I, I wonder if we, if we miss the, the, the aim and miss the target whenever we think that way. On the other side, I wonder if we miss it just as much whenever you'll hear a, a, a theology, you'll hear a belief that says that God's greatest desire for you, if you'll trust him, is, is you're just going to get all the things that you want. I mean, it's, he's just ready to bless you. And, and you, you deserve that new car and, and you deserve that new this and you deserve this and, and God's just ready to give it to you. All you got to do is just trust him because he's ready to give you everything that you want. You see, we can, we can kind of fall off the wagon both ways and I wonder if we, if we miss the point along the way. I wonder if maybe we would look at where Paul writes to Timothy in his first letter and he says these words. That godliness with contentment is great gain. In fact, he goes on to say this, for we brought nothing into the world, and we don't get to take anything out of it. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. But those who, those who want to get rich, follow this. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmless desires that can actually lead people into ruin and destruction because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
didn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's this attraction. And so here's Paul warning Timothy again in his second letter that in the last days when God is ready to do his greatest work, when he's ready to pour out his spirit and give prophecy and vision and dreams, and God's just got this great big kingdom plan for the church, and we come together and, as a people, and our interest is more about what we're going to do with our money instead of focusing on what Jesus wants to do in our lives. And Paul's saying, oh, be careful because because you're going to miss the point if you start focusing on your money instead of what God wants to do through you. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many great grieves. So I wonder today, what would it look like if our question didn't become how much money should I have or how, how little amount of money should I have what if we allowed this question to become, God, whether I receive an extra $100 or not, whether I receive an extra $1,000 or not, whether I receive that letter that tells me that I've inherited a great big bunch of money, my question is not how much I have, but what I'm going to do with it. So how would you have me to honor you with what I have now? How would, God, how would you have me to trust you and to express a surrendered life through my finances to you. I think I could tell you what you would do with an extra hundred dollars. I think I could tell you what you would do with an extra thousand dollars. I think I could tell you what you would do with a massive amount of inheritance that you might receive. You would do with that what you're currently doing with what you've been entrusted with. And so often we tend to think that if I only had, then I would be obedient. If I only had this, if I could just get, get this issue taken care of, if, if, if I just had this financial obligation off my plate, if I could just, I mean, this debt load is just really, really bad. So if I could just, when I just get past this, when I just take care of this bill, when I just take care of this emergency, then I'm going to trust God. Then I'm going to obey what, what, what God's called me to. Then I, I, I think I could step into this life of generosity, I just got to get this taken care of. I wonder if Paul was trying to say to you and I today, it's not the love of money as much as our love of what we think it will do for us. If only we have more. In the last days, Paul says, there's going to be people who miss God's anointed plan because their eyes are on what their money can do for them or what they expect their money to do for them. Well, that's just one that, uh, that again, it gets, it gets pretty specific pretty quick. But there's a second one today that I would just offer for our consideration. And this one is one that I wonder if it could be a little bit... Um, Maybe we misunderstand it because we read it in the English instead of understanding what was taking place actually in, in Paul's letter to, uh, to Timothy. He says, in the last days, there's going to be some people that are abusive, that are uh, proud, abusive, disobedient uh, to their parents, and, and the the images start running wild whenever we think about these things. I, I did a little bit of research, and I think one thing that we could agree on today is that when it comes to the issue of the family, there, there's virtually no disagreement that there has been a significant breakdown with devastating effects on the family in the United States of America. I, I think we could agree on that. Now, there's all kinds of solutions that are offered and all kinds of ideas. Well, I think we ought to do this. I think the problem's here. I think the problem's there. I think one thing that we can just, we can just universally agree on is that there has been a breakdown in the family and it's continuing its trend. Some of the statistics that I looked at uh, this week, again, these are our children living uh, 
with parents that are still within their first marriage. You see, Scripture talks about the need. I, I, I get it. I know who I'm talking to today. I understand that in the church there's been lots of devastation. There's been lots of tragedy. There's been lots of things that have happened. And just because we've had these things happen to us, let's not, let's not avoid the call that God has on his people that, that he, he calls us to live a different life. He calls us to embrace grace and he, he calls us to embrace a transformed life. But this is the trajectory that we see our culture around us uh, living into. That in 1960, the number of children that were living with their parents that were still in their first, first marriage, mom and dad, child, first marriage, in 1960, that number was 73% of all, of all kids that still were living with mom and dad uh, in their first marriage. In the year 2014, 46% of children will grow up in a home where mom and dad are still married, first marriage, raising their children. And the issues of of single parenting, and again, this is not a this is this is not uh, throwing any stones. This is not any accusation. This is the reality of the heartbreak that we often experience, even within the church. That I believe God wants to heal us of. But single parenting in 1960 was nine percent. In 2014, again, this these are these are just statistics. You do with them whatever you want. But I think it speaks to the call that God has on the church to be a people of reconciliation and healing. In the year 2014, 26% of the white population experiences single parent living from, from 9% to 26%. Among the African American community, in 1960, that number was 38%. In the year 2014, 71% will grow up in a single parent environment. Now, I can say these things in the same breath telling you that there's someone that I know and you know personally that these numbers break their hearts even more than they would break ours. When I talk about this kind of stuff with Marcus and Angela Howard at, at my church training center, their heart breaks over these statistics. Folks, this is not a racial issue. This is an epidemic that the church has got to deal with. And, and the way that, that we deal with it is that, that we train families to how to, how to, how to get along and, and, and what does it look like within a, a, biblical, stri a biblical structure of, of what does it mean to be a holy people, to be a last day's people where God is pouring out his spirit on the church. You see, Paul's saying, be careful. Here's what God is offering. He's going to offer visions and dreams and prophecy, the power of God to fall on the church. And this is also what can take place, that, that many times through tragedy, we see a trajectory of statistics that should break the church's heart because they definitely break God's heart. Many of you know firsthand the painful tragedy of divorce. You're saying, Pastor, you, you've got statistics. I've lived that nightmare, and I know the pain. You can talk about nights where people were up with their kids trying to work through things. I've done that. I'm not going to tell you that I understand all the dynamics. I am telling you that it seems as though God would be saying to you and I today that we're to be a church where healing can take place. This is not the government's problem. This is not, this is not a, a, another organization's responsibility to fix. If we as a church, if we want to make a difference in our world, doesn't it seem to stand a reason that the church could be on the forefront of some of these gaping wounds that the church has the privilege and the responsibility to heal? One of which I, I'm so proud to tell you that Tulsa Hills Church is a part of this healing in a variety of ways, but one of which is Martha's Foundation where we're continuing to partner with Myrtle and her board and her team with, with 
with young mothers that, that need to hear something other than you messed up. With, that need to hear something other than, well, I hope you just I hope you make it. They're, they're looking for a, a, a church, and we get to be the kind of church that, that joins and partners with, with Martha's foundation to, to come in beside these girls and their, and, their, and their precious kids and say, we want to be a part of, of changing this trajectory. We want to part, be a part of the hope and the healing that God wants to do. You see, in the last days, we will stand at the intersection. We will either be a people that say, we want to see God's visions and dreams and prophecy and his power poured out on the church in very tangible ways, including family dynamics, or we're just going to say in the last days, these are some of the things that are going to happen. Gosh, that's too bad. Wouldn't it be better? I remember back in my day, back in 1960, we didn't have as much of this problem. I want to tell you today, anyone that says back in my day, you're missing the opportunities of God wants to do today. You see, today is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it and start stepping into the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants to do today. He wants to be a part of of hope and healing and reconciliation. And this is what really I think, I think this kind of stirs the heart of God. I believe it, it grieves the heart of God whenever we just let these statistics start becoming our identity. When we allow the tragedy of statistics to become just a part of, well, that's just kind of the way it is. These are the opportunities that God has given us to be a people, to be a last day's people that God has in mind. But there's something about this passage. I just want to ask you to consider for a moment. Here Paul is writing, and, and he, gets, he gets so pinpoint specific that I got to tell you, if I was in the church that Paul was writing to Timothy about, I'd be a little uncomfortable. I wonder if sometimes we want Scripture to coddle us so much and comfort us so much, and, and it certainly couldn't be about something that, that I need to deal with. I mean, it's, it's got to be whenever we read anything that, that could possibly be of, of correction or uh, of any kind of, of an issue, we, gotta, we just gotta, got to shirk it on someone else and, and, and push it off on somebody else. But here's Paul saying, in the last days, here's some things that are going to happen. Oh, and by the way, remember that last part of this passage? where it says, I don't want you to have anything to do with them. That's not, that's not looking at ways, looking for ways to kick people out. That's not looking for ways to, to, to limit what, what God is doing. But it is, again, an example that Paul would be saying, be careful, because some attitudes that can start making their way into the church like yeast will start taking over before we realize it. It becomes the dominant thought process, and we don't even realize it. And Paul is willing to get really, really specific here. So put on your your, your Greek hats just for a moment, because here we go. Whenever Paul says, this is a terrible thing that can happen in the church, there will be people that will be boastful, proud, abusive, and disobedient. We get get our ready-fixed idea of what that looks like. Here's what Paul was addressing. When he used that word, boastful, uh, he, he spoke to a word, alazon. Say that with me, alazon. Oh, man, you sound so Greek smart. That was wonderful. Alexon, really, it just means this. It means my agenda matters most. It means I'm so committed to my own agenda that I'm willing to exaggerate or overstate facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, even lie if it will get the response that I'm looking for. If, if it supports my cause, if it, if it supports my agenda, that's what matters most, that my agenda matters the most. And so, again, here's here's. Paul's saying there's going to be people in the church that are more committed to their own agenda than, the, than what God has in store. Then he uses this word proud. Proud, again, it says hooper phanos. Say that with me. Hooper phanos. Man, you guys are smart. Hooper phanos just means this. It means that my perspective matters most. Not only do I want what, what is most important to my agenda, but I'm only going to think about what I want to think about, my perspective. You know what this sounds like many times when people will say, well, that's just what I think, as if we're to brag about that. There's been a lot of things that I've just thought about in my life that are definitely not of God. 
And so here's Paul saying, there's going to be a day that comes in the church when people are more glued to, more anchored to their perspective just because that's the way I feel or that's the way I think or even to, to say, well, that's just the way I see it. And Paul's saying, it's a tragic day when people are more committed to what they see in their perspective than gaining, gaining a kingdom perspective on any issue. Then he uses this other word, abusive. Blasphemio, say that one. Blasphemio. Turn to the person next to you and say, blasphemio. Really, I mean, you know, lay into them a little bit. It'll feel good. So blasphemio means this, abusive. It it means that my method matters most. Do you you see where Paul was willing in this letter to Timothy to to kind of lower the guard a little bit? And to start getting a little more specific than we often think Scripture does. Blasphemio means this. It's the need to speak in slanderous and disrespectful ways against those with whom you disagree. Paul is willing to say that there will be a day, even within the church, that when people disagree... They will use whatever words necessary in their language to speak the most slanderous statements and then be willing to even back it up by saying, well, it's true. And Paul is writing to Timothy saying, this is the recipe for the breakdown of the authority of the church. These are the things that are necessary. These are the things that will be present in order for the church to cease to be effective for the kingdom of God. And and we'll feel like we're, we're doing a good thing by identifying all of this. And here's Paul writing to Timothy saying, this cannot happen in the church. It just cannot happen. We forfeit our kingdom authority. We forfeit an anointed call on the church whenever we start exchanging that for for these things and we'll feel good about it the last one again this is not just an issue about parents this is not just an issue about family but he uses the word disobedient now say this one with me ath peas ath peas say it ath peas now say bless you because it sounds like someone sneezed Athpiz means simply this, that my desired outcome matters most. It speaks to this issue of someone who is unpersuadable, uncontrollable, and unleadable. That what I want, I want. And what I want, I'm going to get. And I'm not interested in learning about anything else. I'm not interested in thinking about anything else. I'm not interested in giving any thought to anything else. I just want what I want. And in fact, it seems as though Paul would be saying to Timothy in this this moment, when the church becomes so self-centered about what they want and their agenda, and when people, when individuals want what they want more than what God is wanting to do in the church, whenever people want their perspective more than a kingdom perspective, whenever a a, a church says, my agenda matters most, I've attached myself, I've anchored myself to some kind of an agenda, we forfeit the power of the Holy Spirit within the church. Now, that's why Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you can't have that in the church. This is not a call to eliminate anybody. Never has been, never never will be. It is a call to understand that what God wants to do in the church is so powerful. It exceeds all other structures. It exceeds all other organizations. It it, it exceeds anything else because the kingdom of God is, is the most real, the biggest thing on the planet. And the church is responsible to embrace that reality. If the church is not called to embrace that reality, whose responsibility is it? Now, Paul uses this, they're disobedient. They want their desired outcome to their parents. There's a breakdown in the family that can happen. But Paul, think about this. Here's Paul. 
he considered Timothy, not his biological son, because he wasn't, but he considered Timothy his spiritual son. I wonder if Timothy, if Paul is speaking to Timothy saying, there will be a danger when one generation, Timothy, starts rejecting the generation before them. I am so thrilled and so thankful that we can with confidence and even by observation say that Tulsa Hills Church is a cross-generational church. Turn around and just, just put your head on a swivel for a minute. Find someone older than you. Oh, that's what... I'm not saying to tell them how much older than you they are. But find someone, look, look someone in the eye that's older than you and say, I'm better because you're in my life. Now find someone younger than you and, and tell them, I'm better because I have you in my life. Here's a trend that has been taking place in the church, not, not in the year 2019, not in the, 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 the last decade or the last century. Evidently, this was a trend that was taking place some 2,000 years ago. Paul is saying to Timothy, be careful. And I wonder if he's even speaking to his spiritual son, Timothy. Please hear this. I wonder if Paul is saying to Timothy, the recipient of the, the steward of the next generation of the church, be careful what you reject. Be careful what you decide is archaic because you're standing on shoulders of people that have gone before you. Uh, we, we've had uh, a number of, of humorous memory conversations in our home lately. Some of you are, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Some of you are, are um, you, you've come to Tulsa Hills Church over the last five to, to ten years, and, and I'm thankful that you didn't have to endure the first ten years of my ministry here. Some of you have been here that long, and <laughs> And uh, I just flat wore you out. Because when I came here 20 years ago, I was, I was so smart. I, 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 knew, I knew so much. And, and I would sit around a, the, the table, even with, even with, with Ray and Claire, whenever we'd go home and, 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 and see them in Kansas City. And, and no, now don't tell, don't let anyone tell Claire that I told this story. She'll get a big head and we just can't have all of that. So... But I would, we'd sit around the table with, with Ray and Claire, and we'd talk about different issues. We'd talk about stuff that was going on and trends and changes. And, and because I was so smart then, and I just, I, just, I just knew so much, I just would have a lot that I had to say. And, and Ray, just in his, in his, if he could fit a word in every once in a while, I remember one time in particular, he looked at me, and, and Christy has learned, to, she's learned, she's, she's, remembered it better than I did, but I think it was, because I was too busy talking, it was something like this, when Ray said, we ask our greatest questions with our most profound statements. And you know what my response to Ray was? Yeah, I know a lot of people that do that. What in the world? That's just prideful, arrogant, youthful, you know, I mean, it's just dripping with all of this. Because I was a generation that I just thought, it's, it's, we just got to change things. We got to fix things. I mean, the church is broke and, and, and everything is broke. And so a good thing that, that the next generation has arrived to, to, to fix everything. And here's Paul saying to his spiritual son, oh, Timothy, be careful. Because you can adopt such a me first attitude where your agenda, your perspective, your methods become your mantra. And you'll forfeit the things that God wants to do in his generation to generation church. 
How, what, do we, what do we do with that? Well, I don't know that the responsibility is completely on, I don't know the responsibility is completely on the youngsters, the young whippersnappers to make sure they don't do that. I wonder if the responsibility is equally as much on those who have gone before, those that are in the generation that, that have had a little more wear on the tires, to be a people that say, we want to be a last days people. I'm going to have Christy, I'm going to have you go ahead and come on up. You see, the issue is not just found where Paul would say to Timothy, in the last days, these are some things to watch out for. These are the things that could go wrong. I wonder if it's the responsibility of an older generation, an experienced generation, a generation that is needed in the church to stay focused on Acts 2 where God says in the last days as a last days people what we want more than anything is for God to pour out his spirit on his church and we get it there's going to be new dreams and visions that our sons and daughters are going to receive words of prophecy not to change the church but to edify the church to continue moving forward in the gifts and graces and anointed power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if in this warning that Paul gives to Timothy, it would be a reminder for you and I as, in, as a cross-generational church hungry for what God has, that we would be able to say collectively, God, I, I don't want to... I don't want things to be about me. But I would admit to you, I have a tendency to operate out of my own perspective. And I have a tendency to be anchored to my own agenda, and I don't even know it. So I need you to speak to me. I need you to give me words of prophecy, not about the world, not about everybody else. I need you to give me a fresh word about me so that I see my finances I see my family, I see my relationships, not through my agenda, but through yours. And so this would be our prayer. God, I choose to live with the last day's perspective of the resources that you've entrusted to me. I don't want to be in love with my money. I don't want to be in love with what I think my money should do. I want to be a good steward with the the finances and the resources that you've given me. Show me what that looks like. And help me to discern your voice and walk in teachable humility as you continue to pour out your power and your presence in every single facet of my life. It seems like that's what God offers best to the church, his power and his presence to fall on his people. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come up if, if they would. And as they're coming, let's just let that prayer, let's let, the, let's let the calling of that prayer just kind of linger in our hearts for a moment. Lord, what do you, uh, what do you have to say to me about me trusting you with my finances? Because I don't. I just do not want to be one that's known as a lover of money or a lover of what I want my money to do because quite honestly, the resources you've entrusted to me are not, they're not about me. I want my life to be about you. To be honest, Lord, I, I can become anchored in my own agenda and tethered to my own perspective and I don't even know it. I just admit to you right now that on my own, I realize I'm not enough unless you come. On my own, I'll be so impressed with my own attitudes and my own thoughts that I'll miss what you're trying to accomplish. So I just confess my need to you today, regardless of age, 
regardless of, uh, of where we're at on any kind of, of, of issue in society today, we are more interested in what you have to say to your church as an anointed people than anything individually that we have to offer. So speak to us. Church, let's stand and let's, let's sing this together. to be a people that are so caught up in our own resources and our own agenda and our own stuff that we miss what you have in your anointed measure for us as a church. We need your help. We invite you to have not only a conversation with us right now, but we actually invite you to have a conversation with us in the hours and days to come. We want to get this right. We're not tethered to what we want or what I want. We cry out for what you want. In so doing, <clears throat> we would admit to you that it's only going to be by your spirit and your power that you, you accomplish this. That's why we would say again today with outstretched hands, that now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus from generation to generation forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.